views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Demartini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Transformation Talk Radio all of the above. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, for tuning us in and turning us on. It's really great to be plugged in with all of you. Mr. Benny has been popping in all the great music for today, and I love that. Hello, Mr. B. Good day, Pat. Hey, I'm telling you, we got a good one coming up. Good one coming up. Um, I am so thrilled, you know, to have uh, Richard Barrett joining us today. Why? Well, what my soul told me with this amazing author, speaker, you know, joining me here today. For those of you that know who he is, you're quite familiar with his work. You're quite familiar with what he does to help people uh, change, transform, and how he does it. Whether it's speaking, uh, whether it is, you know, in front of a group of people and helping folks learn something new or a radio show. You know, he is one of the thought leaders of our times. And, you know, and what does that even mean? Well, it means that we get to look at our lives and we get to look at what we value in this world and have a conversation about whether or not we're going to be able to move forward in this life with those values. Do they contribute to the greater good of the planet? And what we're being called forth to do, to know, and to say. You know, Richard is the author of many books, many, many books, many articles, you you know, and many things that I love to read about. You know, whether or not we're, we're talking about the metrics of human consciousness, which I loved previously talking with him about, or what my soul told me, we get to hang out with him and talk about what values-driven organizations, individuals, life, and global society really means. Is it a time for us to connect, befriend, trust, and become one with our soul? Well, I'm going to leave that up to Richard because we got a lot to talk about here today. Richard, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Pat. So what my soul told me, uh, I'll tell you what my soul told me 13 years ago. My soul told me uh, not to hang up when I dialed the wrong phone number. And uh, here I am 13 years later talking about stuff that a girl from the Bronx never thought she'd be able to talk about with anybody. So I love this title of the book, and I love this. What is this in in the world we live in today? Do we have the wherewithal, Richard? Do we have the wherewithal to even hear what our soul is telling us? Well, we all have the wherewithal, as you put it. Um, (laughs) It's whether we listen. That's the key. (laughs) You know, um, you know, the, the, the byline to this book, uh, What My Soul Told Me, is a practical guide to soul activation. And, you know, the title has a, like a double meaning in a sense because uh, I wrote that book uh, in like two or three months, which I've never done before. It usually takes me a year to write a book. And a lot of what I wrote down was what my soul told me. But the, you know, the title was also what my soul told me. So it was like a total soul... Um, hmm, uh, how shall I put it? A collaboration, um, that particular book. And uh, it is actually 
of all my books, it's the one that's uh, really the most popular because it helps people get uh, f- figure out where they are in their lives and how to move forward um, and uh, how to uh, let go of the fears of the ego so they can blend with the values and the motivations of the soul. I love this. When I open the book, here's what I found. I'm going to read it if you don't mind. I love no. this because this, this is something, you know, I, I love being reminded of things like this because it helps me put one foot in front of the other. It says, when you open up the book, it says, your soul has a plan for your life. That is why it shows your body. You can get on board with your soul's plan or you can ignore it. The choice is yours. If you choose the path of your soul, your life will no longer be your own. You will have to become the servant of your soul. Oh, boy. I I <laughs> never thought in a million years, Richard, me, that I would be able to relate with a statement like that. But I do not think I'm alone. No. It's powerful. It's really profound, isn't it? I mean, I... <laughs> Hearing you read it, I've got shivers all over me. I mean, I wrote the damn thing after all. (laughs) Yeah. The question is, did you really write it? But my soul wrote it. Exactly. (laughs) You know, don't you love stuff like this where you and I get to talk about who's really in charge? Let's talk. Yeah, yeah. I want, I, you know, who knew I was going to be talking about this part of the book? But, you know, sometimes we think, Richard, we don't really have a choice. You know, we sit here and we think, wait a minute, I'm off on this path. How am I going to figure out how this whole deal is going to turn out? And so I would love for you to talk about what this means for us to step into this place to make the choice and what we have to do. What, are the, what is the story we then get to create from this, as you so beautifully talk about in the book? Yeah, we we all have a story about uh, the, to try and explain the world. I call it a cosmology. It's a big word, but really, what it means is that we we we've built up a story to explain what our lives mean or don't mean. Uh, and um, and um, what I do in this book is I share my story or my cosmology, my understanding of who we really are, and. It begins with this idea that actually we're all souls, energetic beings, living our lives in this physical body, and that's our primary reality. And when we when we uh, reason from that reality, it all becomes so much clearer. For example. Um, I've looked everywhere in the scientific journals for an explanation of where does the will to survive come from. And and there is none. Frankly, there is none. But for me, the will to survive is simply the soul's will to be present in this three-dimensional physical reality. And and, and that is that's important to the soul. The soul incarnates because it wants to do three things. It wants to express itself fully. It wants to connect with other people and it wants to contribute to our collective humanity and that's it that's what the soul wants and anything that we do that blocks that creates it not just dysfunction in our lives it creates also disease um, so it's kind of important to get on board with that idea of who you really are uh, you know, and, and this is really for many of us, you know, stepping out into this place. I think one of the things that we get to do is we get to tell a story. We get to, you know, retell the story and we get to take what we're learning and hearing uh, from this connection to our soul that can take us into a direction, uh, like I said to you before, a direction that none of us could have predicted for ourselves. I mean, and how do we know? that we are, let me just say this, on track. How do we know we're on track? What does that feel like, in, you know, in, 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 in your words? What does this feel like to us as we look at the energy field around that? Well, the big picture is it feels like we're in the flow. That's mm-hmm. the big picture. But actually, it feels different. 
okay. uh, depending on what age we're at, because we all move through these seven stages of psychological development, the first three of which are all about the development of the ego, and the last three of which are all about the unfoldment of the soul. And the middle stage is where the ego gets its motivations into alignment with the motivations of the soul. That's a very important stage, which occurs usually in our, from our late 20s to our late 30s. And it's in the 40s that we self-actualize, that we begin to feel the soul's impulse to um, do what we love to do. I was uh, exactly 45 years old when I realized my career as an engineer, a transportation engineer, was totally boring. And I realized that what I was really interested in was not transportation, but transformation. And I I remember thinking to myself, well, you know, when I was much younger and deciding on my career, I must have misheard my soul because I thought it said transportation, but I think actually it said transformation. Mm -hmm. So I laugh about that, but actually it all worked out brilliantly. Um, And I think many people, when they get to their 40s, begin to uh, resonate with something much deeper that gives their life a sense of meaning. And The challenge there is to be able to get over the fears that are blocking you from moving down that path so that you can uh, embrace the soul journey. Yeah, I love this because this is really, you know, uh, what we're looking at in terms of so many people call in with questions about their purpose, question about their life, question about their steps. And you are so right about turning 40. That thing just shook me up completely. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the four steps to soul activation because that is uh, what this book is also about. What My Soul Told Me, A Practical Guide to Soul Activation. There's actually so much that I would love to speak with Richard about. But when we come back, we're going to talk about this activating your soul. Can anybody do it? Do we have to take a class on it? Or do we simply maybe have to show up and listen? I can't wait to hear what Richard's got to say. We'll be right back with the show. Tune in to The Truth is Funny with Colette Stephan each Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This hit show will have you thinking outside the box and riding the wave of infinite potential. Join Colette on the Higher Self Network, inspiring listeners to shine their brilliance and ensure success while roaring with laughter as they recognize the humor of the giant cosmic joke. Visit TheTruthIsFunny.com. Tune in each Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 Eastern Time on Transformation Talk Radio to Limelight Radio with Katina Macris. This is an inspirational, cutting-edge radio show educating worldwide listeners on the diversity of Lyme disease-related topics. Each week, Katina will interview some of the world's leaders in health, wellness, spirituality, and human potential. For more information, visit LimeLightRadio.com. The doctor is in. Tune in to the hit show, The Psychic Love Doctor, with host Deborah Lee. Deborah's life affirming, highly perceptive reading method has taught Deborah how to zero in on specific problems with relationships, career pursuits, and current roadblocks to success and happiness. This inspiring show will help you never feel helpless in life or love ever again. Join Deborah Fridays at 2 p.m. Pacific Time right here on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Naturopathic doctor, founder of the Martha's Vineyard Holistic Retreat, and author of the New York Times bestseller, 21 Pounds in 21 Days, Dr. Ronnie Deleuze has helped tens of thousands of people, including celebrities and athletes, with her message of lifestyle change. Now, Dr. Ronnie Deleuze wants to help you. You, too, can be saved. Email Dr. Ronnie Deleuze at info at ronniedeleuzeonradio.com and visit mvholisticretreat.com. Dr. Ronnie Deleuze, your partner in wellness. Let me bring love 
Oh my goodness. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. It's so great. What my soul told me with author and speaker Richard Barrett joining me here today on the Dr. Pat show. And I wanted to make sure all of you out there, um, we have a copy of the book, Benny. Why don't we go ahead and do this and give away a copy of Richard's book? I love this book, What My Soul Told Me. Uh, 1-800-930-2819. one 930 what I love about this book is Richard, what you said earlier, and I, and I think it'd be great to talk about it. Is it's in the ta- it's it's sort of in the subtitle, a practical guide to soul activation. Um, and so the question really then becomes, you know, why is soul activation so important, and then how do we go about it? And I think this is part of what we were going to talk about today. Right. Yeah. Now, why is it important? I mean, it's important because that's who you are. I, um, uh, I mean, you know, uh, you're ignoring your reality if you're ignoring your soul. Um, and so uh, that's why it's important. And as I said earlier, you know, what the soul wants to do is express itself, connect and contribute. And you are unable to do that because of the fears that you learn early on in life uh, that's a severe handicap for uh, soul activation so how does it begin you know it really yeah. begins with connecting with your soul you know um, giving your soul a reality um, I, one of the ways that you can do that is to Move into the space of what I call the uh, the uh, person who is watching rather than at, uh, in the action. You become your own self witness, and you know when you get upset, you know you can't move into the self witness immediately. But as soon as you can, say to yourself, "Okay," in my case, "Okay, Richard." Okay, you just got really upset and you know that behind that upset is some sort of fear, an unmet need that uh, was suddenly triggered in with you. With you. What, what is that fear, Richard? So, you see, that conversation, that very conversation separates you uh, from the ego. You see, the person who's asking that, question observing you is the soul and the person who you're observing is your ego's response to a situation that just triggered you so becoming your own self witness is like the first step in soul activation because you you don't get carried along by your emotional upset you you were able to separate yourself from them and look at them and so as soon as you can do that, you're into soul consciousness. Mm-hmm. And that is like the beginning baby steps for beginning to um, connect with your soul. Richard, I want to ask you a question um, that, you know, many of us really uh, ponder and have gone through. You know, we go through life and there are some things that happen in the world. Uh, and of course, we're part of what happens to them. How we respond to them is different than that. But is there any truth to this idea that if we are not following, if we're not following what our soul is telling us and directing us, that life can become extremely uncomfortable? And, you know, and the reason I'm asking you that question is because you also talk about in the book, you know, this idea of changing from needs to consciousness as well. And yet we are such a need driven society, right? I need a car. I need a husband. I need a wife. I need, need, need. And I wanted to ask you about this in terms of, you know, some of the signs that show up in our lives to let us know, uh, you know, are we listening to our soul or not? So the thing that uh, keeps us away from our soul are our fears. And yeah. um, 
And the fears begin when we believe we have needs. Now, the first three stages of psychological development are surviving, which is usually not to two years old, then conforming from three to eight years old, and then differentiating from eight to uh, late twenties. And some people never fully learn how to differentiate. And each stage has different needs. So obviously the surviving stage is about getting your physiological needs met and uh, the, the the conforming stage is about uh, finding safety and protection and, and being loved and the differentiating stage is about being respected and recognized in your uh, community and uh, teenagers have re- sometimes have real difficulty with that they they, they, they can't find a community that res- they resonate with and they can't find the, a place in in a, a group where they, they, they feel happy. But respect and recognition, that's the key to differentiating. So we have these needs. We have these survival needs. We have relationship needs. And we have self-esteem needs. And, and uh, when you get to the next stage, the individuating stage, you begin to let go of the fears that you have about not meeting your needs. And so you get to the point where you can say, you can begin to say to yourself, I have no needs. Now, it sounds a bit hilarious at the beginning, but but actually, I mean, there are we all have requirements. We require oxygen. We require food. But they only become a need when we don't have them, when right. we're short of them. Okay? And so uh, starting from the premise, I have no needs, you what you begin to realize is you the soul provides for your needs before you even know you have them. But the soul can't do that if you're living in fear, and if you're living in fear, you're living in needs. So getting and mastering your needs is the key, and mastering the fears associated with your needs is key to opening up the space for you to connect with your soul. And as I say, uh, you know, so first of all, we learn how to become our own self witness, and then you can use the mantra when something's upset you, it's basically an unmet need. You can say to yourself, Well, actually, I have no needs because all my needs are met by my soul before I know I have them. And that again lifts you out of the fears of the ego and moves you into the domain of the soul. Mm. Um, what do you find? in 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 the journey that we take on this what do you find the greatest challenge is for us to make that transition the greatest challenge for us to actually as you say uh you know embark on soul activation well the, the first challenge is 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 <laughs> believing <laughs> that you actually have a soul but the, uh, right okay you know i mean uh, here's an interesting thing I, I, about 3 months ago i was speaking at the uh, esade business school in in, in uh, barcelona it's a, one of the biggest and best business schools and the topic was spirituality uh, creativity in management and i had the opening keynote speech and i spoke about i had the audience do this exercise and i had them stand up if the, the, the statement I made was true for them. So wasn't... I give them a practice run. I said, I have a car, and no, most of the audience stood up. And then I said, I am a car. And uh, everybody sat down. And then uh-huh. I said, uh, I have a soul. And 300 people out of the whole audience stood up. And then I said, I am a soul. And they stayed standing. And I said, okay, so do you have a soul? Well, are you a soul? There seems to be some confusion here. And then I said, well, actually, those are stages in our own understanding. First, we believe we have a soul. Then we believe we are a soul. But then comes the next stage when you realize, actually, the soul has you. Mm. And that's a very profound shift when you realize the soul has you you. Now, interestingly, this next speech after mine Uh was uh, by a couple of neuroscientists, Uh and the first slide they put up said, here are our assumptions. Now, remember, I just had the whole audience standing up saying, I have a soul or I am a soul. So, here are our neuroscientific assumptions. 
Assumption number one, there is no soul. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. <laughs> I could oh. not believe it. Uh, because the whole audience, which were academics and uh, consultants and right, researchers, right. had just stood up. Right. And so this tells us something about, and, and I tell you, you read uh, practically any uh, of the top uh, psychologist or yeah. psychiatrist books and they're great books by the way Yeah. and you look in the index for the word soul you won't find it right? because the scientific establishment needs to be credible with each other and there is a tacit or underlying agreement amongst the whole scientific community that there is no such thing as a soul mm. That's the biggest issue we have to get by if we want to change the world, in my opinion. That is a giant one, a giant issue that we have to get by. And how fascinating that that, you know, someone said to me a long time ago, we live in a world of paradoxes. And and I have always said, you know, okay, great. I'm waiting. Show me. And then, you know, life has shown me this because I think the soul does listen. Uh, what I'd like to do is, you know, take a short break when we come back. There's something you talk about in the book that I absolutely love. But I started to read it, Richard, and I thought I've got to ask him about this. When we come back, we're going to be talking about full spectrum consciousness. And, you know, here's the first sentence, folks. Think about this. It says, do not be fooled into thinking that from a consciousness perspective, higher is better. I love what Richard writes about because if he doesn't get you to think about stuff, I don't know who does. Stay tuned. We're going to take a short break. We're going to be right back. Well, you done done me and you bet I felt it. I tried to beat you, but you so hot that I melted. I fell right through. Tune in to Prescience Life Radio with host Mia Simone. Mia is devoted to sharing her extensive knowledge on the invisible worlds of energy. Join Mia and discover the science of intuition and connect with your greatest gift. Start living in your potential today and every day by opening up to the power of inner knowledge. To learn more about Mia, visit presciencelife.com. Do you want the freedom to spend more time with your loved ones? Travel the world? Live spontaneously? Get ready, because the Chip Justice Show is here. Hosts Dr. Pat Basile and Chip Justice can help you build meaningful success while embracing life. Living a life you love is the end game in this new, inspirational, and empowering show. Positive changes for a life you'll love. Tune in every month on TransformationTalkRadio.com and visit PositiveChangeInstitute.co for more information. Artie Hoffman is the hottest psychic with the warmest heart and the host of the hit show Angels and Answers. A renowned psychic, medium, spiritual life coach, and an entertaining motivational speaker, Artie has helped over 15,000 people with his amazing intuitive gifts, his passion, and his humor. Call 877-ANGEL-02 to schedule a personal reading or to have your own psychic Artie party. That's 877-ANGEL-02. And visit ArtieHoffman.com and Angels and Answers on Facebook. My dream is to end homelessness. My passion is living a green life. My dream is to end poverty. My passion is volunteering. My passion is making a difference. My dream is to cure Lyme disease. My passion is rebuilding communities. My passion is helping those in need. My passion is caring for the elderly. My dream is to find a cure for cancer. My dream is to leave a better world for my children. We all have that special passion, that lifelong dream that drives us to live our lives with meaning and to create a better world. No matter what drives you, we can all make an impact. Dr. Pat Basile is helping others make their dreams come true so we can all help make our world a better world. To learn more about how Dr. Pat is building a community of sharing hope, strength, funds, knowledge, and information, visit abetterworldcrowdfunding.com today. That's abetterworldcrowdfunding.com. Cool done run out 
I'll be giving it my best. This and nothing's gonna stop me. But divine intervention, I reckon it's again my turn to win some or learn some. But I won't hesitate. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Uh, it is so great to have Richard join me here today. And I want to make sure that you all know how to find out more about Richard. You can go to richardbarrett.net, and it's Richard B A R R E T T dot net. Uh, Richard, do you have another website that we, you want us to send folks to as well? No, well, that one works pretty well because it's actually embedded in a website called valuescenter.com. Yeah. And so once you get to richardbarrett.net, you're into a much bigger uh, uh, collection of material from my company, which measures and maps uh, values and consciousness all over the world. And you can actually go online and do your own personal values assessment, measure which levels of consciousness you're operating from by simply going to the www.valuespluralcentre.com uh, slash PVA, personal values assessment. And in a couple of minutes after doing the very short uh, survey, mm -hmm. uh, you'll get an email back describing and showing you on a diagram what levels of consciousness you're operating from at this moment in time. And, you know, 10 years from now, that will look a little bit different. And another 10 years later, it'll look uh, even more different. So... Um, that's uh, something that the listeners can do in order to get in touch with the, 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 the concept of operating at different levels and leads us right into this idea that you mentioned before the break about full spectrum consciousness. Yeah, and I want to talk about that. Now, what I did is I read this, and actually, I'm, you know, look, I'm one of these folks that uh, reading was not my strong suit as a kid growing up. But when I read it, I read it back again, and I said, well, wait a minute, does he mean that? And then I went on. And what it says is it says, do not be fooled into thinking that from a consciousness perspective, higher is better. But Richard, come on, higher is better, more is better, right? <laughs> uh, well, you see... I you yeah. know, yeah. if you go with that idea, you're going to yeah. try and accelerate something that really shouldn't be accelerated. You need to move forward through your different life stages. And, um, you know, the first three stages, which are up to the age of 30, uh, the, there is a real purpose in those stages. And those the purpose is for the ego to establish itself within the cultural framework of its existence so that the soul can then fully express itself, connect and contribute. Now, if the ego hasn't done its work properly, then the soul will not be able to manifest its desires. And that's why I say it's about full spectrum consciousness because you need to be able to master the survival level, the relationship level, the self-esteem level, the transformation level, the internal cohesion level, the making difference level, and the service level. You need to be able to master every one of those stages to live your life to the fullest and experience um, full spectrum well-being. Yeah. You know, uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, also ask you about this in terms of the levels of consciousness. And, you know, I thank you for mentioning the website because I did, I did complete that, you know, the first time you and I talked. Um, mm. But I wanted to ask you about what we identify with. What, what is the level of identi the identity we have for the different levels of consciousness? Now, I said something to you earlier. When I was 17... I, I was homeless. And so here I was. I was definitely in a survival mode. Definitely in a survival mode. But I will say this to you. I had moments. I had moments of what you refer to as flow. And how did that show up? You know, I had a moment where I made a conscious decision to drive across the highway and ask somebody for help. I don't know why I did that but I must have been soul-directed. So can we be at multiple levels of consciousness uh, simultaneously? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you see, we grow in stages of development, and each stage is representative of a level of consciousness. So, you know, the baby uh, grows through the survival stage, not to two, and then the child grows through the conforming stage, um, three to eight, and then through the differentiating stage. Well, in these first three stages and all of the rest of them actually are also levels of consciousness. So, so when you were 17, you were at the differentiating stage of psychological development, looking for respect and recognition and trying to find a community where you felt um, at home. But at the same time, because you didn't have a home, you dropped down to the survival level of consciousness. So you were at the psychologically the differentiating stage but actually you would drop down to the survival level of consciousness it didn't mean to say that you were like a baby again no you just drop down to focusing on what was necessary in order to survive and also probably I would suspect um, also uh, focusing at the relationship level because when you lose a home and you you know you lose a base you often lose friends and when you lose friends then you don't have support and protection so you were also probably trying to find people who you could form relationships with I would suspect Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, for me, it was really great to be able to have that experience because I don't know how one learns what they need to learn later on in life uh, without having an experience like that. And what I mean by that is, you know, what did I learn from that experience? Well, there are many things I learned from it that I never thought in a million years I would ever use in life. I would ever use in a job. I would ever use in a school endeavor. So does the soul, uh, this is the only way I know how to ask this question, Richard, you, you know, does the soul help us connect the dots that then create the picture or the vision for the pathway of where we're going? As I say in the book, you know, the, the, there are these four stages. We connect with the soul, um, then we um, befriend, befriend the soul, then we trust the soul, and then finally we become one with the soul. Okay. And it, it, yeah. you have to move through those stages uh, to get into fully operating from soul consciousness. So it is a, it is a progression. And what is interesting, as you begin to trust your soul, and begin to identify with your soul and you look back on your life you can see even though it was painful in a way it was perf perfect because as you just said you learned so many things d during that period in your 17 and 18 years old that stood you in greater stead much later on in life and so and for me, uh, you know, I got to the age of 45, realized my passion was the evolution of human consciousness. But when I look back at where I, would, where I was, I was working in the World Bank. I had traveled. I've been to nearly 80 or 90 different countries. I understood how the world economic system worked. And I was perfectly placed then to shift into my soul activation with an understanding of global transformation. Now, if I hadn't have followed that career path, if I hadn't have done those things, I wouldn't have been so perfectly and better able to um, respond to what my soul was asking me to do. And I think that's true for nearly everybody I've met. There comes a point in time where you know, hindsight becomes twenty twenty vision. You can see clearly yeah. <laughs> the path you are on. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to talk with you, if we could, about trusting the soul, trusting the yeah. soul. You know, as you were speaking, there is there are so many things. I, if I had like a checklist in front of me, Richard, I would be yep, yep, got yep, yep. I I actually think that the that the challenge for a lot of folks is this idea of trusting the soul, especially if things in the outer world don't really look like that is a thing that I should be trusting. And I would love for you to talk about this because I really do believe that trust is an issue. Well, you know what? I told you during the break, I studied this for eight years. <laughs> 
Yeah. It, is it an uh, issue? Is it not? I mean, you know, yeah, Richard, I, I think I trust my soul, but I don't know. Yeah, well, it is. Uh, you mean you're exactly right. I mean, you even so, there are four stages. Now, let's talk about the trusting stage. There are many levels of or evolution of trust in the soul you you have to in a sense you know you begin by thinking well this is a great idea but dare i do that and and even just in the phrase dare i do that comes up the fear of letting go of control of satisfying your ego's needs you see the key i think at this stage is letting go it is a, and it's something I discovered just you know in my life that there comes a point in time where letting go is so fundamental, and as you let go, you let be. Um, just a few years ago, um, I, I've spent a lot of letting, done a lot of letting go in the last uh, ten years, uh, and one of the biggest letting goes I had was. Um, I had a house in Asheville, North Carolina, and I had gone over to England to look after my mother, who was, bless her soul, was in her 99th year, and and just decided that she couldn't cope at home. I mean, just decided, 99, and that she would go into a home. Actually, it was 98 and at that time. And uh, after a few months, she, she got very sick with pneumonia and almost died, but then uh, got out of hospital and went back into the home, but never got out of bed again. And at that point, I decided that she needed me and I would be there. So I went, I left America and I went to, I went back to England and lived in my mother's house for almost a whole year, during which my mother did nearly all her aging. And uh, during which, at the end of which, she died, having just achieved 100 years, uh, 100 years and 15 days, which was fantastic. But you see, uh, I then decided that I would stay uh, in the UK, and uh, I had this home in America, and um, I built a life for myself back in the United Kingdom. And came the point in time that I put the house on the market; it didn't sell. And then uh, after about a year or two, I'm uh, living uh, on holiday in Italy, and I get a call saying, oh, we found a buyer for your house. And I said, well, well, that's great. I just started two weeks holiday. I'm not going to be able to get back immediately. And they said, well, no, they want to buy it within three weeks. I said, well, you know, how am I going to do that? And I said, does that person want to buy any of my furniture? And uh, they said, yes, uh, he did. And I said... How about he buys everything? I mean, everything in my house. I'd already taken my clothes out. That was my precious books. And they came back and said, yeah, give us a prize. I gave him a prize. He bought everything that had been accumulated in 60 years of living. And that, I tell you, is a lot of letting go. Wow. It's a lot of letting go. It's a... a, Wow, you know, I, my soul was telling me to be in Europe, and and do, I didn't really have a home there, uh, which uh, could ac- I could ac- bring all that stuff over. Mm-hmm. I just decided to let it all go, mm. and it turned out to be, you know, a, a life affirming and changing decision. Because when your life is full, you have to let go in order to let the new come in. Mm-hmm. When you're full of stuff, you, you know. You, so, so being an empty vessel is just a metaphor for for uh, aligning with the soul. But as your ego becomes, as you empty your ego needs, you allow your soul's growth and uh, expression to fill that space. So, letting go is a fundamental lesson, I think, for everybody. And as yeah. you let go, you, what you're doing is you're letting grow of the things that you think you need, but actually you don't need. You know, I want to ask you to clarify something because, um, you know, I think we confuse a few things and maybe not. Maybe it's me. I'm confused, Richard. One of the things is uh, I am somebody that has always had an expectation. And let me say what I mean. What I mean by an expectation is I've always had a desire to create X, Y, Z. Uh, in a life 
I've always had this as a desire. Now, even though I have this desire and I take action, I don't get attached to the outcome or the way that's going to go. So, for example, I, I wrote on the back of a business card in 2003 that I wanted to help a million people live life full out. I never thought in a million years it would be through radio, and that's how I dialed the wrong phone number, and I'm here today. So can you talk about letting go of needs, but yet having a vision for what you want to create? I can, yes. Yeah. Um, I've been through multiple stages. Uh, you know, we in our uh, you know in our forties, we we feel like we we want to find our purpose, and then uh, that purpose gives our life meaning, and then we create a vision of what we want our life to be, and 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 as we create that vision, we move forward to it. But but the question is, who is the one that is having the vision? Is it the ego or the soul? Um, it is so much easier to create that soul's vision. But there comes a point where you even move beyond the vision. And that's when you trust your soul and move then to becoming the servant of your soul. At that point, you give up purpose, you give up mission, you give up vision, and your life is just directed by your soul. You wake up each day and you listen. What is it that I need to do? And this is how uh, I choose or that my soul chooses to write books. Uh, it instructs me about which books to write. And once I get into writing that particular book, I get fed information and I've learned now to recognize uh, that synchronicities rain down on me when I'm in that mode. Um, I, somebody calls me and tells me about a book. I go and buy it immediately because I know that is my soul connecting at a higher level of consciousness so that it can help me um, or help itself mm -hmm. in a way and as that happens I become an empty vessel I become an empty vessel directed by my soul and at that point I don't have a vision I don't have a mission I'm not striving for anything I'm just wanting and loving being the instrument of my soul and receiving daily input about what I have to do and if I don't know or I get too intellectual about what it is I'm doing, writing, I, it, I get the intellectualization blocks my soul. So then I stop it and I say, okay, so what's next? And so, uh, and within 24 hours, I've got the answer. When I'm feeling upset and uh, don't know quite what to do, um, I say, I'm handing this over to you, soul. Yeah. I love I'm it. letting go of this and I'm handing it to you. And miraculously, whatever it was, you know, kind of either disappears or gets resolved in some way. But as long as I hang on to the notion that I think I can correct it and I can control it and I can do this and I can do that, it just gets worse. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it's like, ah, become the servant of your soul and you'll get the daily instructions about how it is you have to lead your life, how you need to be and what you need to do. And it'll all boil down to three things, as I mentioned earlier. One, fully expressing your unique gifts and talents, which you've learned to do in your radio program. Two, connecting, which you do on a massive scale. And third, contributing. Mm -hmm. That's all the soul wants to do. It wants to express, connect, and contribute. And if you can do that and keep doing that right through beyond the age of retirement into your old age, you'll have a long and healthy life. Well, you know, this is what I'm going to do it a lot better now after listening to you and chatting with you about it, for sure. Because, you know, I, I, I love being reminded. I mean, I love being reminded. And I, what I also love about this, Richard, and having this conversation with you and about the book is that, you know, we can really look at what it means to connect with the soul. And you talk about this and you give us some tools to do that. Uh, and, you know, what you just shared about this place of giving it to the soul, 
I think that's brilliant. And the sooner that I think I can learn to do that before my mind has a, an opportunity to completely twist things up, turn it around, um, the better it's going to be. You know, I don't know if this is true, but sometimes we can get get beyond any point where we even recognize that we're twisting ourselves up in things. And what I hear you say is that, you know what, it's really never too late to give give it over to the soul. It's never too late. You know, there isn't anything that we can't undo if we put it in, you know, soul consciousness, right? Yeah. Where we fall down always is we think we have needs. That's the thing. And that's why we have the control. So if we can give up the idea of thinking that we have needs. And by the way, Neil Dolan, Donald Walsh's fifth book on called Communion with God, I think it's called, is has a brilliant expose on on why we have no needs. It's, it's a remarkable book. Um, anyhow, but uh, so, so it's letting go of that idea means then you have to let go of control. So as soon as you think you have a need, then your life is not perfect. And when your life is not perfect, then that opens the door to fear. And as soon as you open the door to fear, then you want to control. And that's when it all goes wrong. Well, I'll tell you what, fear and doubt are great, uh, you know, great cousins to have in the backfield. You know, I mean, between those two, they can pretty much create a showstopper in just about anything, fear and doubt. You know, I don't, yes, they can. you know what I'm saying? I honestly, fe- I, I've had, you know, some fear stuff in my life. And, and you know, I, I actually think doubt is the real showstopper for things, right? Yeah. Doubt, um, says, um, you know, I'm really not sure. And the reason I'm really not sure is that I don't think I'll be able to get my needs met if I go in that direction. It comes back to needs. Yeah. Well, you know, for today, uh, first of all, let me thank you for uh, joining me here on the show. And I want to thank you for, you know, writing this book. Um, I guess the question that I would love to ask is, you know, what is the personal message? What would you like to leave with us today? And thank you so much for all that you do. Well, let me thank you for uh, all that you do. I mean, without you doing what you do and following your soul passion, uh, I'd never be able to communicate what I do to so many people. So, you know, I'm just bouncing all of those that gratitude back to you. I think uh, one of the most important things that I've learned as I've shifted into soul consciousness is that actually at that level of reality, um, we're all one. What do I mean by that? We're all, a soul is an individuated aspect of the universal energy field. And so at the level of the universal energy field, uh, there are just lots of individual fields. There's you, there's me, and there's also all the other billions of people on the planet. But you see, what I realize what I realize is that when I give to you, I'm giving to myself. And that's when you begin to realize that serving others is like serving the universal self. It's giving is like receiving uh, there is no separation involved anymore. And I think the th- last thought uh, I'd probably like to leave with people is when they're in doubt about what it is that they need to do in a particular situation, is simply to ask the question, what would love have me do? What would love have me do in this situation? And that cuts through all of the ego fear stuff and and gets you to the core of who you really are, a soul having a human experience. Richard, thank you so much. Richard Barrett, everyone. What My Soul Told Me. And uh, thank you so much for the book. Thank you. So I'm looking forward to your next book. So I hope you get it back. (laughs) <laughs> you too. It's funny. Hey, everybody, thank you all for tuning us in and turning us on. And you know what? This is so cool that we get to have this relationship 
with our souls. And you know what? If we listen and we trust and we do a bunch of other things that Richard has put out so beautifully in the book, happiness, contentment, and joy shall be ours. Yeah.